I'm excited today to begin a new series called Romans, the Great. And this first message is called Free to Live. Free to Live. Now, this, this chapter, Romans 8, is one of the most power-packed chapters end-to-end in the whole Bible. There's so much in this one chapter of Romans 8. And so we're going to go through this over four weeks. We're going to try to unpack what's in here a little bit at a time. And uh, I think you're going to love it as well. And so I'm very excited that we'll get to do this. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, please pull it out and open it to Romans chapter 8. And so if it's your phone, great. If it's a hard copy like the one I have here, that's fantastic as well. But hopefully, hopefully you have your own copy where you can read. You know, the Holy Spirit may speak to you as you're reading and say something completely different from what I'm saying. And that's fantastic because we want you to hear from God more than anything else. And so uh, please pull your Bible out, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Big shock, right? Romans 8 verse 1 says this, there is therefore now No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I thought that might, okay, all right. I thought there might be some cheering or some whoop whoops or some hollering or standing or balloons or confetti. But you're like, okay, hang on, Danny. We're trying to be good church, you know, quiet people here and not get too crazy. By the way, I want to remind you and give you a practice of saying the word amen. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, so if you're really into it, I can't tell because your face is covered and the eyes are too far away. So feel free to say amen if you like something, all right? And that'll encourage me and people next to you. That'll wake them up, right? So so Romans 8, 1 says something really amazing. And it just, we read it and we're kind of like, yep, that's really good. Like, But do you see what we just read? Okay, all right. Maybe it will help if we can give some context. Now, before we do that, I want to remind you of what they have in every good action movie. You know what it is, right? In every good action movie, they always have this one scene where somebody's about to fall off a cliff, and then somebody reaches down and grabs them, right? Every good action movie has that, and they're hanging, and there's like death below them, and they're holding on to somebody, and they're like, I got you, and they pull them back up. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so, now, I don't know how it works, but sometimes there's not another person. It's like a post. They're falling down the cliff, and they grab the post, you know, or maybe it's a, a, a rock that they're able to grab onto with one hand, and they're hanging by one hand. But it's amazing how it always happens. They're, they're falling, and falling, and falling, and falling, and then boom, there's that one thing that saves them, right? And that's what we have happening here. In fact, if you go back to Romans 7, if you turn back, to Romans 7. Look at verse 15. This is going to kind of give us an idea of where we're heading here. Romans 7 verse 15 says this, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anybody identify with this? You're like, that sounds like me. I want to do that and I don't. And I don't want to do that and I do it. Okay, so we know what we're talking about. So this is Romans 7, 15. He's talking about this this wrestling match that's going on. And then he finally wraps it up in verse 24. He says, wretched man, or as the case may be, woman, that I am, who, here's the big question, who will deliver me from this body of death? So he's like, man, I don't want to do these things, but I'm doing them. And I want to do these, but I'm not. And I'm back and forth. And I don't know. And I'm falling. And then boom. There's this answer, and the answer is Jesus. And so in 8, verse 1, we see this amazing news. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can't figure it out. We don't even understand ourselves. But boom, Jesus is there with that hand to catch us and to save us, to rescue us. No condemnation. That's really good news for me 
And I hope it's good news for you as well. Jesus is our rescuer, the one who is going to save us. And so I hope, that, I hope that you're encouraged already. So now how does this work? And it begins to explain it some more in the next couple of verses, verses 2, 3, and 4. Let's look at these together. For the law, here's the problem, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So we have these two laws. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. He did what we couldn't do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that, verse 4, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's a lot in there, right? So we're going to see if we can unpack that in a little bit easier way. And I'm going to need some volunteers here in just a second. So be ready, guys. All right, be ready. If you're thinking about being a volunteer, this is your big moment. All right. So here's this one. And then here's this one here. Okay. Now I'm going to need a volunteer, somebody who's willing. Oh, Ryan, perfect. Come on down, Ryan. This is perfect. I love it. All right. So Ryan... Come on down. This is Ryan Beatty. Everybody say hi, Ryan. Come on over here, Ryan. Come on. All right. So, Ryan, you get to be all of us. Okay? You ready for that? Okay. So, but this is the problem. You've got this. All right. So, stand right here. All right. So, Ryan is all of us, and we have this, right? That's what he talked about. So, just stay right there. You're doing great, man. Okay. So, here's the reality. We have this problem, right, of death. He talked about this. But God made a way for us to get out of this with the law. Because if we can keep the law, we can get out of death and go to life. Right? Okay. So God gave us the law, and the law is not bad. But there's a problem. So here's what I want you to do, Ryan. I want you to pretend that we're at an airport. You like airports? It's traveling, right? Okay. So we're going to pretend that we like airports. Now this right here, I want you to pretend like this is one of those metal detectors, okay? I, didn't have, I wasn't able to bring mine this morning. So we'll just pretend, all right? So metal detector here. And I want you to, you know, try to walk through. Now, if you get a, a ding, 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 then you get to continue. But if you get an ah, eh, you have to go back. Okay? Are you ready? Let's see what happens. Ah, eh. oh, sorry. Okay. You want to try again? All right, let's see. Ah, eh. okay. What's the problem? Well, he has this, right? He's got sin. And whenever we sin, we're breaking the law, and we can't use the law as a way to life. That's what, the, that's what the scripture is saying. He's like, we couldn't do it on our own. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. What did he do? By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. I need another volunteer. Anybody else want to volunteer? Ben, come on. Perfect. This is ideal. All right. So, Ryan, you stand right here. Perfect. Now, Ben, Ben, thank you. We needed you. All right. Come stand right here. So, Ben, this is going to shock his parents. Ben is Jesus. <laughs> Good job, Jesus. Thank you for coming. We needed you. Ryan really needed you. Okay, so notice any difference between Ben and Ryan. Can you stand right here beside him? Okay. He's a little taller. It's, it's more obvious than that, though. What's on his shirt? No sin. Great. Okay, now, Ben, remember what Ryan did. I want you to try the same thing with this uh, law metal detector. You ready? Okay, let's see what happens. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, good job, Jesus. So Jesus passes the law. He fulfills, as it says, the righteous requirement of the law. He did it. High five. Great job. Okay, so you want to try again? No, it won't help. Never mind. Okay, so, so what do we need? Somebody who can fulfill the law has to fix his problem. And that's what he did. Okay, so Ben, I'm sorry, Jesus, come back over here to Ryan, all of us. Now, here's what Jesus did. We know what he did, right? He took our sin on himself, right? And then he died carrying that sin to the grave, and he condemned sin. Sin is done. Jesus took care of it, right? And instead of sin, he did something else. He made it possible for us to have Oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit. All right, guys, see if you can both walk through the law now. Ready? Ding, 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 ding. There we go. Very nice. 
All right, you guys can have a seat. You did a great job. Give them a hand one more time, please. So when you look at this passage, it's like, okay, what's going on? What's happening? But the reality is we couldn't solve it. No matter how hard we tried, our flesh is too weak. But God figured it out. He sent Jesus, the perfect one, who died our death and took our sin and canceled it so then we can have life instead of death. That's how this no condemnation thing works. He's given us life. He's canceled our sin. So that's, that's the great thing. So um, what I should have asked Ryan after he finally got through the law requirement, the, the problem, is if he wanted to go back again. I hope he would say no. But this next verse talks about this, this struggle that continues on. Let's keep going. In verse 5, let's see what happens here as we look at this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so here's, here's what happens. We've, we've been moved from death to life, but we have this ongoing battle every day where we have to decide, am I going to be thinking and geared toward death or am I going to be geared toward life? And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us that. So there's this fork in the road every single day that we have. And, and I just ask, where is your mind? He says here, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So how about you? Where is your mind going day after day after day? Which way? There's a fork in the road. There's this uh, app that I just recently found. It's called Life Cycle, and it tracks you everywhere, right? And so don't worry. This isn't my actual stuff. Don't analyze me. Don't, don't fix me, right? This is just one from the Internet. But this, there's this, it's tracking. Where are you going? Where are you spending your time? And then it shows you. At the end of a day, at the end of a week, here's what you did. You're like, oh, wow, that looks, wow, i got to fix some things, right? But that's what we're asking here with your mind. Where is your mind going? Are you thinking death thoughts, flesh death thoughts? Or are you thinking spirit and life thoughts? Are you choosing life? Because, you know, we have this option every day. Which way am I going to go? And wouldn't it be crazy for us to go back to where Jesus has rescued us from instead of going to where he's brought us life? Why would we do that? Well, it kind of goes back to what we said in 7. We have this battle going back and forth. Look at verse 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And you know this is true, and I know this is true, because there are times when whenever we're thinking these flesh death thoughts, and, we, and we're heading that direction, and then we're like, okay, um, God, I don't want to hear from you. And it gives us a prompting that we should do this. We're like, no, 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 leave me alone. I got my own thing going. And so we know that we do become hostile toward him, because we don't want to, look at that word, submit we don't want to obey. We don't want to surrender our will to his. And so we get this battle, this struggle going on. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So here's one of the things we're, we're hoping to do through the Awakening series. Okay, so now that's 36 days away, if you count today. 36, so it was 40 last Wednesday. And I encourage you, hey, if you want to do some kind of fasting or whatever, let's do it. But now you have 36 days. So you still have time to begin to think about what's coming up. By the way, so the Daniel fast is the thing that I'm, I'm trying. Anybody ever done the Daniel fast before? This is no joke. This is no joke. So anyway, if you want to try it, usually a Daniel fast is 21 days. Okay? So if you want to try the Daniel fast to get ready for our awakening series, you have two weeks to think about it. And then you'll have three weeks before we actually begin on, on the 24th of October. All right? So you still have time. We're trying to get in the mindset 
prepared for what God's going to do. Because here's what he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And we need God to show us where are we, what are we doing? Because sometimes we just continue on the same track. We don't even realize the things that we're doing. So we say, God, open our eyes, awaken us to what you're doing. So that's what we're praying for in this awakening series. And we have time to prepare. So I hope you are preparing. And so whether you're doing the the 36 days fast starting from today, or if you wait until next week and make it 28, 29 days, or you wait until the Daniel and do 21, I encourage you to do something. So whether you're giving up coffee or Instagram, which would be huge, video games, uh, sweets, do something to prompt yourself to pray and to begin to say, God, what do you want to speak to me? What do you want to say to me whenever we begin this intentional time of awakening, seeking God in some new and fresh ways. Because we cannot please him if we're living in the flesh. And so we want to wash out, refine away anything that's not from God. So we have this battle for the mind that's going on, back to the flesh and death or to the spirit and life. And so there's this battle going on. But then I love how this first little passage finishes up, 9, 10, and 11. Here's verse 9. You, however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Do you see the power in these words? You see, whenever somebody says, you are fill in the blank, they're making what? An identity statement about you. Okay? And remember in school, the old phrase, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Not true. Words hurt. Sometimes people say, you are whatever, and it hurts. Or they say, you are something good, and it's encouraging. But you are, whenever someone starts with that, you say, okay, hang on. I'm not sure if I'm going to receive that or not. But look at what he says. He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So what he's saying is, hey, hey, I want to remind you, you're not over there anymore. You're over here now because we keep forgetting, don't we? And our minds take us back to this other place. He's like, no, that's not you. You've been saved by Jesus to this other life. He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Like if you've been saved, and he says this next, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. The Spirit is the one that does the saving. And so that's one of the clear things in Scripture we can see. And this is one of the best verses to say. The Spirit is the one that seals us for salvation. And there are other times we can see clearly where the Spirit will come and will fall on us in powerful and different ways for a season. And then it will go away. But there's this indwelling Spirit that saves us, that holds us, that seals us. And he says here, if you don't have that, You don't belong to Jesus anyway. But if you have it, you can't lose it. Scripture, I believe, makes very clear. He says, so remember who you are. You're not that anymore. Because we have this this burden that we carry. Like, I don't know if I can do this. It's like, no, that's not you. I have good news. You are in the Spirit if you've been saved. You don't have to go back to the old life anymore. But here's the reality in verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. What did he just do? He just told us that we've got two things going on. Both are here together. The body, which is dead because of sin, and the spirit, which is life. And they're both together. Do you see that? It's like, yes, I know that. I live that every day. I feel the weight of my body, and it takes me one direction, and yet my spirit's saying, no, go this way. It reminds me, actually, of um, this, this idea of a tree. A tree that is growing in a rock. You ever seen this before? And this is such a cool thing. Whenever a tree, that's the only place it can grow because that's where the seed ends up, and it finds a way to begin to grow. But it's a really bad location. The real estate is not good for this one. 
Like, I, the, the long-term plan isn't great. So this tree begins to grow. So you have life in the middle of death. That's what this reminds me of. It's what he's saying in verse 10. Christ is in you, but the body is dead because of sin, and so the spirit is life, the body is dead, and there's this, this togetherness. And, and so here's the question. Which one is stronger? You see, there are several lies that Satan throws out there, and he's really good at selling lies, by the way. He's really good at this. And so different parts of the world, actually, he spins different lies for them. Did you know that in the West, as, as I've heard from people and so on, I've learned, and I believe it's true, the lie to the West is the spiritual realm is not real. It's not real. And you see that. It's like, okay, go after this material thing. Buy this bigger house, buy this bigger boat, buy this bigger car, get this better job, whatever, right? So it's all physical, physical, material, material. Spiritual things, ah, that's for the weak-minded people, right? So that's the Western. The spiritual is not real. But do you know what the lie is for the Eastern culture, the Eastern world? The lie is this. Evil is stronger than good. There's no denying that the spiritual realm exists, but the, but the lie from Satan is evil is stronger. And what do you think? I got a picture here of the little angel and the little demon, right? And for you, like whenever you see those two, which one in your mind is like, ooh, that one's stronger than the other? You know, and it's easy to believe this idea that the bad guys are stronger, but it's not true. It's not true. You see, Satan wants you to think, that you cannot win in this struggle of life and death being in the same body. Now, by the way, I have good news for you. When we die and this body is buried, we change and we graduate. And then God raises us back from the dead and on the last day. And from then on, we never struggle again. We're perfected, okay? So there's a day when the struggle will be over. But for now, we're in the struggle. We're in the struggle. And Satan wants you to think... He wants you to think that you can't win. He wants you to think that it's not possible. Whatever that deal is, whatever that struggle, that sin, that habit, that pleasure that you can't turn off, he wants you to think it's not possible for you to win. But the reality is God says, let me help you. Let me help you. Because he has the power. So here's what Satan wants you to think God's power looks like, an ultralight airplane. Anybody ever flown one of these? Anybody here ever flown one of those? One, two, a few. He wants you to think this is, this is how God will carry you. The reality is he's going to carry you in something much bigger and stronger. That's the reality. He's got incredible power. I had to go with Boeing. Sorry, guys. So... Airbus guys, you'll be okay. I know they have that 380 thing that's decent sized, but no, it's not small. It's, it's huge. It's massive. Satan wants you to think that this is the value. This kind of jewelry is what you'll get if you're walking with God, right? The reality is what? No, he has amazing, fabulous, super expensive things for you. He has the nice stuff for you uh, finance people. Let's see if we can get into your world a little bit, right? Satan wants you to think, Here's, here are the resources God has available for you. Is this true? I mean, you're like, okay, God, those people, they're so weak. Here's the reality of what God has available for you. Oh, look at that. now we've got a response. Everybody's like, hallelujah, I received that. $10 trillion, you can buy about whatever you want with that. Are you ready for the last verse in this passage? Are you ready for this last verse? Oh, one more, one more. Satan wants you to think you look like this, the weak guy. Oh, no, don't have it. Never mind. We'll go away. Not that one. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's look at the last verse in this passage. Verse 11 says this. If, listen closely, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Yes, thank you. 
It says, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is available. That kind of power is yours. You have access to do the impossible. How? Through the spirit that is living in you. And so I want you to know today that the good is stronger than the evil. That God is stronger than the enemy. That light is stronger than darkness. And that he wants you to have victory. He wants you to be free to live. He wants you to live, and he will help you do it. He says, I can't do it. You're right. But he can by his spirit in you. So the, I showed you a picture of the, the tree growing and the rock. And so you have the death, the death, and the life kind of mixed together. And I have what I want my life to be like. Here's another version of the tree and the rock. Look what this tree is doing to that rock. Uh, it's not fair. This tree is owning the rock. The tree is taking over, almost completely hiding the rock. And that's what I want. Yes, I'm stuck in this body, but I want the life of God by the Spirit to just dominate over anything that's death, anything that's bad, anything that's flesh. How about you? Do you want that? You can have it. You can have it. And that's such good news for us. So two calls today. Maybe the first thing is for you to receive the life for the first time, to have that ding, 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 ding moment where Jesus takes you from death to life. So you trust Jesus and he takes your sin. He buries it with his death and he gives you life by his spirit. And so some of you need to take that very first step of trusting Christ today. We have a verse for you. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God shows his love for us. He's not against you. He's for you. He shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, he came for us. And we're going to remember that in just a moment through communion. And so if you're ready to trust Jesus today, you can pray a prayer, uh, something that you come up with, or we've also offered one here, and it just goes like this. Uh, so if you're ready to trust Christ today, you can pray and receive him. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. You can just pray a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. Today I turn from my own way, and I choose to trust you and follow you. Please forgive my sins and make me a new person. I give myself to you. Thank you. Amen. And if you're trusting Jesus, we want to know that. We want to encourage you. We have an email set up, yes, at dbicc.org. Just send us a quick email, and we want to say, oh, man, we're happy for you. We want to help you on this new journey. If you're already a believer, I want to encourage you to listen and receive the life that the Spirit wants to give you. The Spirit wants to give you freedom, and He wants to give you life, and He has the power to do that. So I just want to pray over you. Maybe there's that one thing that you can't let go of, that one flesh, that one death area, and I just want to pray into that today and for God to open our eyes. But will you receive that? Will you say, you know what? I'm going to receive the life that God wants to give me and walk away from the death that I've been chasing. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for those who are taking that very first step of trusting you today, receiving the life that you give through the Spirit because of Jesus and his sacrifice. Thank you, Father. May they grow. May they thrive. May they see new things. May they find good friends. May they be hungry for your word. Lord, do something miraculous in their lives as they choose to follow you and experience life. Lord, others of us, we've taken that step, but we've gone back. We've let our minds head back to the crazy stuff, the old stuff. And so we just ask for your help by your spirit. We can't do it. We know that. But you can. And so we just ask for your help. Show us. Open our eyes to those areas in case we're blinded to that even. And then if you would, Lord, in your grace, take us one step toward life. And then the next step. And then the next step. And so, Father, I pray against discouragement. People who've been told by that whisper in the ear from the, the enemy, I, you can't do it. Uh, somebody else, but not you. So, Father, I pray against those discouraging words, and I pray for life. I pray for courage. I pray for strength. 
I pray for inspiration to take the first step, to acknowledge our need, to receive the power that you offer. Thank you, Father, that you've not left us, but you've come along and you've made a way. Help us to enjoy freely the life that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.